Welcome to Everything STEAM. I'm your host, Sam Stanford. As a physicist and structural engineer with Jacobs Engineering, I've made many connections with some bright individuals who are either working, studying, or self-taught and passionate about our particular topics of discussion. If you think crows are mysterious, intelligent, amazing, or scary, well, you've stumbled onto the right podcast. In this episode, we plan to discuss the family of Corvidae, or Corvids for short. Now, I know we touch on this in the episode at some point, but the Corvid family belongs to the order of Passeriformes, more widely known as the Songbird family. They consist of crows, ravens, magpies, jays, nutcrackers, and jackdaws. For most of the episode, we will be focusing on the Corvus genus of crows, ravens, and rooks, while widely touching on the family of corvids overall. My guest and I will discuss the cultural connections between humans and corvids, the social behavior of the Corvus genus, as well as Corvus cognition. Now, I seriously can't express how thrilled I was to reel in the guest star that I did for this podcast. She is an absolute delight and the queen of Corvid science communication. So without further ado, please meet Dr. Kaylee Swift. Kaylee has loved wildlife, especially birds, and asking questions about animal behavior and cognition for a very long time. While she was an undergrad at Willamette University, she discovered that crows and other corvids offered the perfect marriage of her interests and has been hooked on them ever since. In 2012, she was awarded a National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellowship to pursue this passion as a graduate student at the University of Washington. As a master's and doctoral student, she dedicated herself to understanding what American crows do in response to dead crows, as well as what adaptive motivations might drive their response. Her graduate research included both field-based projects observing wild crows and non-invasive or non-lethal functional imaging studies aimed at understanding what was going on in the crow brain during these experiences. After graduating, she spent a year as a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Washington studying the foraging behaviors of Canada jays in Denali National Park. And currently, Kaylee is a visiting lecturer at the University of Washington, where she teaches a variety of ornithology and wildlife ecology courses. In addition, science communication will forever remain a core part of Kaylee's identity as a scientist and a person. She steadily gives public talks to audiences ranging from elementary students to career academics. Her video, audio, and print reports of research are publicly available and have been featured by National Geographic, PBS, The New York Times, The Atlantic, The Ologies Podcast, Science Friday, and many other reputable sources. If you want to learn more or connect, do head to her website, corvidresearch.blog. So, now that you've been introduced to my guest star and the topic of this podcast, we're going to head into our first segment where we plan to talk about the influences that corvids have on human culture. Cheers. Kaylee, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, me too. I Listen, I, whenever I... I got to research you more and see all of the different uh, ways that you've been science communicating. It was really fascinating. You've been, uh, you've hosted a TED talk. You've been on Ologies, the Duncan Trussell uh, podcast. That's that's fantastic. And it seems like the more that I dive into things, uh, the more I see this amazing interest in in corvids, especially in the research that you do as well. So it's it's really awesome. I'm happy that you're here. Uh, to talk to me about it today and, and also the listeners and I guess the people who are watching too. So this first segment, we're going to talk about how corvids are incorporated into human culture. But I think before we get to that, I have to express because I know you told me to go through uh, the different things that you have on like your your blog page, but also your Instagram to kind of test my knowledge on corvids. and surprisingly no, not surprisingly right um i know physics right. and engineering so i i don't know much and i was surprised to learn all of like the behavioral things that i did with corvids it, it, they're so unique so special so intelligent and i feel like uh everybody should should learn about corvids it, to some to some degree because i walk through life kind of not not ignorant in the root sense, but just ignorant in the fact of how how special these birds are. So that's just wanted to make a quick note before we jumped in there. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I attribute a lot of my 
ongoing science communication, social media presence, to just the fact that the wellspring of like cool crow facts uh, never seems to dry out. <laughs> so it makes it makes that part of my job really easy. Oh yeah, absolutely. And we'll get into that as we move along. Um, I mean, even with with how they tie in with human culture is is super fascinating. Would you mind running me through some examples, some maybe famous examples that people that are watching and, and listening can uh, relate to? Yeah, so I'll start with what I think is the most common perception that the majority of your listeners, which I assume are primarily a North American audience, are going to have. And that's this idea that crows and corvids are um, harbingers of death, that they're ominous, um, that they have this very dark and foreboding presence, so on and so forth. And so one thing right off the bat that I want to offer to people is we see that that has, you know, particularly in contemporary cultures, is true, but it's a very particularly Eurocentric perspective on these animals. Because the thing about crows, and we'll um, get to this a little later, they have a very high distribution around the world, right? So, so crows and ravens in particular are found on every continent, really except um, Antarctica, and then they haven't made it down into South America, Central America yet. But otherwise, they're everywhere. And, you know, there's all these different species. Some of them are very avoidant of people, but enough of them are exist so closely in contact with people that they've just rooted themselves really deeply in our storytelling traditions and in the just sort of general cultural zeitgeist. So when we look at kind of the typical Eurocentric perspective of these birds, a lot of that association comes from things like um, the way that we feel about how the dead should be handled and cared for and periods of time in European history where there was a lot of dead people just kind of out, whether it was because of religious warfare or um, during periods of prolonged disease like the plague. Mm. And we don't tend to like dead bodies getting eaten by animals. That's not a part of our of, of many religious traditions in those parts of the world of how you move from this space to the next. So we don't really like that. But that is what corvids are gonna do when there's a big abundance of bodies. And so that's one of the main uh, reasons that they, that they have that association. Now, interestingly, that wasn't always a negative thing. It, it, like the fact that seeing a crow outside your window was an indication that you might soon be doomed was like seen more as a like nice heads up <laughs> than it yeah. was this this cue of, of doom and foreboding. We really see that shift during periods of times like the plague. And then of course they get, um, they get, they infiltrate just more general cultural things like, you know, Hitchcock's the birds and the ways that mm. we continue to use these birds in media as indications of foreboding, right? And so then that kind of progresses that. But if we look to other cultures, we see that they can have really different symbologies. So for example, in Japan, crows are thought to be associated more with prosperity and fate. Uh, mm. In you know ancient Greek times, they were associated with romance and love. Uh, so these birds can have really different meanings for people depending on what time period in human history you're looking at and what particular peoples you're interested in, in asking that question in relationship to. That's so true. And, and, you know, you said the North American approach, but like, I bet if you looked at more of the indigenous cultures that are sprinkled all throughout, like North America, Latin America, South America, I bet that it might have its own like differences as well, whether it's like positive, negative, or just anywhere that lies in between on the spectrum, right? Because you just said it's only in that negative sense, it seems more of a, um, a European stance on things, correct? Yeah. yeah, if you look at indigenous North Americans, you can see it's, it's interesting because on the one hand, there are different perspectives on these birds, like, right, indigenous Americans are not a monolith. They had very different um, cultures in some cases. And mm -hmm. so they relate to these birds a little bit differently. But at the same time, there's this really interesting thread across the Northern Hemisphere of some very 
uh, similar storytelling traditions with these birds that oh. suggest that there may have been this like archaic cult of crow, which I don't mean in a, like a literal sense, but just that our relationship and our and the the ways that we incorporated these birds into our understanding of how you know the world came into being and how we want to explain things seems to have originated in some place potentially asia and then kind of like gone spread across north america or excuse me the northern hemisphere and into north america because there's just really striking similarities with some of the ways that that people utilize these birds in storytelling oh interesting so do you think that this negative perception of of crows not even i guess not really negative but more towards just like yeah, I guess the the negative aspect of being assigned like the like what you told us about like the plague, for example. Do you think that perception is is changing the more that we uncover more about corvids and how special they truly are? Yes, but um, I think it's happening more by inches than miles. <laughs> mm. um, it's a lot of people still don't really don't like these birds. Um, and that may factor into it. It, it might also just be the like day to day, you know, annoyances that they can cause people, um, or the kind of economic consequences sometimes of these birds, especially when they form really large groups. And so I, I do think, you know, I've had enough personal experiences of people walking away from our interactions on social media or public talks that I give or whatever, and saying like, Wow, that was really interesting. I I'm gonna think about the crows near my house differently now because of this. I I, I didn't know that they were capable of all those things, and so it, I, that change is shifting. Mm -hmm. But sometimes when you're deep in this community, you get the impression it's shifting faster than I think it really is across you know people as a whole. That makes sense. And I had a podcast episode a little while back with someone who studies uh, sharks. And we we kind of talked about the same thing. It's that it's that uh, the cultural implications is making it inches rather than miles. And in with sharks, that has to deal with like you know the movie The Meg or Jaws or just like mm -hmm. those the infamous uh, music that they put with those movies, and it makes it scary. And you know people are scared, even though that like you're more likely to die from a cow than you are from a shark, or you know in other in other ways of statistics. But like, and that's also the same thing. But a, a good success story to that, that might uh, happen with sharks and, and crows some days, someday, for example, is like whales. Like we had such a horrible perception based on like Moby Dick for, for the longest time. But then science finally uncovered that you know, whales are really cool and they're, they're compassionate, they're social creatures, um, and they have so much more um, involved than what we ever thought. So it, yeah, it, it, it is inches in, in terms of in, in terms of miles, but it's definitely something that has like been overcome before. And I, I feel like it will, you know, with, with Corvids in general, which is very, I guess, hopeful <laughs> for people out there. Yeah. <laughs> that care. Yeah, I think so. I think so. I, I do have a, a really fun story, I guess, for, for people just like, because on, on my aspect, I don't have a lot of exposure. Uh, of course, like I, I go through life and I'm like, oh, there's a there's a raven and there's a crow and I can kind of understand the difference because there's there's the size difference and then the way that the the feathers are are ruffled around the neck, I think, of, of ravens versus how crows are more smooth with their feathers. Is that accurate? Um, mm -hmm. But so my my personal story is I was actually at the Grand Canyon one time with uh, with my family and I was eating uh, cashews in the parking lot and a, a raven flew down and landed beside me. And I'm like, I, I gotta give it a cashew. You know, I just, I gotta be nice. And I, I flipped it a cashew and um, took it and then he like flew away, but then he came back and I'm like, all right, I'll give you another one. That's, that's cool. So we pack up and we leave and we drive to the next destination. It was like, like a half a mile away. I'm not even kidding you. That same raven showed up landed beside me i flipped it another cashew i went to the next destination and it, it showed up again i flipped it another cashew so i don't know it's just it's really cool how like um like with, with all the talks that you've said and what we're going to talk about or like later it's just like their intelligence for for facial recognition and just like um 
I don't know, just awareness uh, also of like where you're going. They're they're wonderful trackers, um, et cetera. So it, I don't know. This was just a really cool experience that that I've had with uh, with Corvids Ravens. Yeah, it's it's funny because it brings up a tricky point, which is the kind of ethics around feeding Corvids, right? Because, and I I get this question a lot because like bird feeding, right, is a very publicly accepted recreation. You know, people put up bird feeders and 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 most cities have agreed like that's allowed, you know, blah blah blah. But corvids get into this this other realm where it can get a little bit trickier, right? Because unlike, you know, a chickadee, these these birds are to a small extent predators and particularly in the breeding season, which is what we're approaching right now, right? It's almost summer. Um they can be nest predators. And mm. so you you can get into these these tricky spaces and that's and there's you know the experience that you had exactly demonstrates how habituated and sometimes like aggressive <laughs> birds can get uh, in terms of asking for food which is why in the United States we have really strict rules against feeding birds in national parks but if you go to Canada they they don't really care there and so like you know you can get a uh, what's called a Canada Jay. Other people might know it as like a whiskey jack or a camp robber. It was also, it used to be called the gray Jay. And you put your hand out and they just fly right to your hand, right? Oh, and they're like, nice. yes, that's cool. Yeah, go ahead. And it, for me, it, it is this tri tricky sort of line because I do think experiences like the ones you have are really pivotal for, for folks in making mm -hmm. connections with these birds in particular, and maybe even with wildlife generally. But there are also sometimes costs associated with that, right? Like if a bird gets too aggressive, then it can become, you know, conflict. And sometimes that can end really badly for that bird. Or if we're over supplementing these birds and mm. bringing too many into an area where they didn't used to exist, their role as, you know, the occasional predator can then be in uh. disproportion to the local ecosystem. But it's so I just kind of want to put that out there for your listeners that in general, my philosophy is like, I'm pro feeding corvids, but I have a very sort of strict uh, ethic and approach that I employ when I do that, because it is, it is tricky. And it's something that, you know, people will, people have strong feelings about. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. And that's something that, that I didn't really think about. And I'm, I'm glad that you bring that up because yeah, yeah. You don't want to accidentally attract uh attention to them that's negative and then also attack or attract attention to um harming the the ecosystem because like i can't guarantee whether that that raven was there or that it would invite other ravens to like you know join in on the on the feasting squad so that makes a lot of sense yeah, yeah I, I think and, don't and worry about noted. that yeah i think you're <laughs> i think your five cashew handout is probably okay sam but <laughs> but hey. it is it like those are the exact stories that make people send me emails to the effect of how do I make friends with crows? And I totally get it. And I have a feeling there are gun there is no, it's not a feeling. I'm going to stake my reputation that you are gonna have a certain number of listeners leave this episode thinking, I want to make friends with crows. And so I just want those folks as they embark on those journeys to do so with a lot of thoughtfulness. Yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, so I think we, we've touched a little bit on behavior here, and I think this is a good stopping point. We're going to run into our first commercial break, but when we come back, we're going to talk about Corvid behavior, which I'm very excited about. So stick around. All right, we're back. This is segment two. And the, okay, so I, I made a whoopsie, I feel like. Uh, this was labeled as Corvid behavior. I realized that Corvid is short for Corvidae which is the family of all of these birds. Unfortunately, we won't have enough time to talk about all of Corvidae. So I think it's more important that we focus on the, the Corvus uh, genus, which involves both the all of the species of ravens and crows. Would you like to, to weigh in on that, please, Kaylee? Or did I yeah, do okay? so this is a really... Th that, no, that was great. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, <laughs> So this is a really common question people get. What What's the difference between a crow and a raven? It's like the most common thing folks ask me. We can go there. And yep. the yeah, so so just really quickly, the 
answer is that it depends on, on what you're talking about. Biologically, there's no difference, there's no definitive defining feature that makes something either a crow or a raven. So if you were to, to find a new animal and you were trying to give it a name and you were like, should I call it a crow or a raven? That's ultimately up to you. Usually we call the bigger ones ravens and the smaller ones crows, but there's no defining characteristic. However, within the Corvus genus to which these birds belong, there are 45, give or take, different species. And so if someone asks me, what's the difference between an American crow and a common raven, two examples of those species, then there are very clear differences that I can explain to you. So that, that question of what's the difference between a crow and a raven, that's why I say it's often a more complicated answer and you have to be clear what you are, um, what specific information you're really seeking. So if you're saying, if I had two strands of DNA from say the American crow and the common raven, and I looked at them, it would be really, really hard to like tell which one was different. It's like maybe like probably 99% um, similar, like 99% similarity between the two. Is that what you're saying? Like it's very, they're extremely similar. Well, it's not, that's not quite what I'm saying. More what I'm saying is that when it comes to like the naming of these birds, okay. there's, that's, that's arbitrary. There's uh, no rule that makes something either a crow or a raven. But oh. when we actually are discussing differences between species that we have already named, then it's very easy for me if someone's like, well, is that bird perched right outside a crow or a raven? I'm like, oh, they live in an area where they have both American crows, which is a species, and common ravens, which is a different species. And here are all the ways that I can tell you that that's an American crow and not a raven. I got you. And so, and that can, yeah, really confuse people because they're like, well, crow, you know, what's the difference between a crow and raven? They're not different at all. So they just look at any picture and they're like, it's a crow because it's in the Corvus genus. It's like, well, that's not exactly right. Because if the picture is of a common raven, it's not very helpful to tell somebody like, oh, it's a crow because it's in the Corvus genus. Because then they haven't really learned what that animal is. <laughs> so that makes um, sense. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Just to explain that kind of further muddies the waters that you already encountered between this language that we use like Corvidae versus Corvid. Actually, there's mm -hmm. a, they're the same thing and like, crow versus crow family and raven and you know how all of that fits together understood i think another thing that we should probably say then before we get into this is is and we talked about this on like through the break that when we talk about the behaviors moving forward we are talking about just crows and ravens uh, but again there's also not a lot of studies out there to be able to point and make parallels between like say uh, a crow and a magpie versus like um, uh, a, a crow and a, and a jay. Is that is that true? Like, there's not as much research out there with uh, with these other genuses. To some extent, yeah. So, um, so all of the world's crows and ravens belong to a single genus, the Corvus genus, but the world's magpies and jays belong to a huge variety of different genera. And most of those have not been studied. A few of them have, you know, uh, scrub jays have been uh, darlings in certain areas of research for a little while. There's work on on like Eurasian magpies, black-billed magpies. But most of the, particularly the tropical jays and tropical magpies are very, very understudied. And yeah, especially when it comes to the cognitive work that's been done, that is very much biased to the corvus birds. Okay. That's, that's, I think where I was getting at. I, I figured like there was still like a decent amount of information based on their like physiology and stuff like that, but maybe not in terms of like their behavioral studies. Okay. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. So speaking of behavioral studies, let's talk about the Corvus genus. And I'm curious what their social structures are like, and maybe we can, maybe you can introduce that and we can get into the weeds a little bit. Yeah, so again, it, it um, comes down to the species that you're interested in. Generally mm -hmm. speaking, all of them are pretty social. There are, some of them are, are more social than others. So, so for example, uh, rooks, which are a type of corvus bird that you would encounter if you went to many parts of Europe, um, are the only colony nesting crows 
of the group. So they're like way more social in some ways than like your typical American crow is. Okay. And we, but then to like further nuance it, even within the United States, we see geographical differences. So one of the really interesting things about um, many of the, the crows is that they're what we call a cooperative breeder, where um, often sons, though it's not exclusively, um, will stay on the natal territory, meaning the area where they were hatched um, for one or sometimes more years. They can even leave and then come back and quote unquote, help their parents with the next brood of chicks. Okay. Um, but even with the United in within the United States, so there's like a lot of social dynamics that come along with that, right? That you can picture. But even within the United States, we see that the frequency that that happens, where cooperative breeding is a thing, is really geographically dependent. It seems to happen more on the East Coast for some reason, hmm. uh, which is the same species of American crow that we have over here on the West Coast. Um, so yeah, it's very like we get into weeds on weeds on weeds when, <laughs> when we start talking about, you know, the social dynamics of, of these birds. I think in general, the species that's probably received the most attention when it comes to their social dynamics are common ravens, um, okay. which are, yeah, really interesting examples because common ravens, once they hit adulthood and they pair up, are fiercely territorial. They are, will really work hard to keep anyone else off of their territory if they can. Mm. Um, but as juveniles or un, unmated birds, um, they are, you know, traveling in a group or having others that you can call upon is a really key strategy to accessing food. Okay. And then the other factor is even though during the day these birds might be really territorial defensive and just hanging out with mostly their mate, at night, they all group together to sleep in these big slumber parties. So there's just so many, you have to be so specific. It's like, our, when, when we ask like how social these birds are, it's like, well, are you talking about the breeding season or the non-breeding season, day mm. or night, adult or juvenile? And so, yeah, there's so much that you could potentially unpack there. Well, that's also really cool because it's not simple. It's, it's extremely complex, which shows a lot of social intelligence, right? There's not just like a, an on and off switch. It's, it's seasonal and it's, um, it's based on day cycles and, and, uh, what's going on like with, with, with mating, like that's, that's really cool. Uh, it's not just like, it's not cut and dry, which is neat. I like that. Yeah, definitely not. And, um, and then when you add in the like final layer of just how smart they are, it can make parsing what we see so much more complicated, right? Because there's mm. so many layers there that you have to, to peel back and, and ravens in particular just exhibit these really intensely complicated social interactions with one another. One of my, one of my favorite studies demonstrated that they, um, I mean, you could, you could make a whole like HBO series <laughs> with how like fiercely political these birds are. Um, so there's a study that came out a few years ago that looked at the ways that um, uh, ravens in more dominant positions, pairs that are more dominant will really work to thwart uh, alliances by would-be competitors. So they're oh. constantly kind of like, yeah, looking around, evaluating everybody else that is in their kind of social circle for you know their their characteristics and what they're doing and if they see two individuals making connections engaging in affiliative behaviors that would increase a bond and they see that as a as a potential threat they'll physically go in and like disrupt that and keep them apart um and wow. so there's just yeah really incredible levels of like intelligence and um social acuity that's that's running behind the scenes that just makes this a endlessly fascinating field of study yeah yeah definitely um and you you did bring this up a little bit I, I don't mean to jump back but you did bring this up about gangs and i think it's really important to go over this because it's very interesting for just somebody who's extremely lay in this topic because they like some species uh delve into juvenile gangs like they're in their adolescence and they uh congregate uh, socially in that manner and act as what you would imagine gangs going around poking fun being brutal ver versus each other and you know looking for food do you want to expand on that anymore 
Yeah, so um, when juvenile birds disperse from their natal area, right, that's a that's a fairly vulnerable period in their lives because they're they're relatively naive. Um, and you know they're potentially navigating novel landscapes that they're not as familiar with, and so there's a real draw of safety in numbers. Mm -hmm. And it depends on if you're talking about American crows or or common ravens. For American crows, we really see these juvenile flocks um, concentrating usually in the fall, right? So after the breeding season, and yeah, they're just kind of like going out trying to trying to figure stuff out, poke around. You know, they're learning really important social skills in that time. I think the more interesting juvenile groups to look at though are in ravens. Because like I alluded to earlier, the um, an adult pair of ravens is is fiercely territorial and they, they're big birds, they're powerful birds. And ravens more so than relative crows um, are more carrion specialists, right? So American crows are what we call a synanthropic species. They're They're very, tied to human development. But ravens are much happier to just, or I shouldn't say they're not happier relative to living in the city, but they're, they do a lot better than crows living way oh. out in like wildland areas, right? And they are, they're very hardy birds. So you, you know, they're gonna like be lasting through like a Maine winter or Canadian winter, or Alaskan winter, right? Where food is mm -hmm. gonna be really sparse. And so um, food, food bonanzas, so things like animal carcasses then become really prized finds, particularly at that time of year. And a territorial pair of ravens will fiercely defend a resource like that. So if mm -hmm. you're a juvenile raven, right, you're flying around, you don't have any territory, you're just kind of like, you know, nomadically searching, and you are hungry, and it's wintertime, and you see this big carcass, and you want to go down and get some, as soon as you get there, that pair is just gonna come annihilate you, right? And get, get, the, get out of here. So what is a juvenile raven to do? And the answer is they need to recruit other birds to come help them overpower this territorial pair, right? And so the way that we have found that they do this is, and they, they did this by um, putting out carcasses, uh, trapping, juvenile ravens and then taking that bird and releasing it at the carcass site. And what they find is they're like, okay, I'm here, I see this, I'm pretty nervous though, so I'm gonna like fly and I'm gonna go to the roost tonight, right? Cause that's what they do at night. They, they sleep in these social groups. Mm -hmm. And then the following morning, they will advertise through these kind of aerial flight patterns that they know where food is. And they'll bring that all of those birds that they've recruited then back to that carcass so that if it is being actively defended by a pair, they can muscle in there and, and get what they need. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. For some reason, it just reminded me of like a, a, a kind of a parallel to like bees, how bees do like waggle dances to like alert like yeah. the hive that there's like, you know, food over here. <laughs> and then and then they go and, and do their thing. Um, not exactly the same thing, but like I was just thinking of oh they're, right. It's this know, is a little, it's like the selfish version. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. No, that's really cool. Oh, I love that. I love that. So I, I know you talk. I mean, your your work has a lot to do with how um, crows behave whenever they deal with death. Would you Would you like to go into into the weeds on that? Because I think that's really cool. Because you, you do speak a lot about pro funerals and uh, it, it seems like the funeral thing is a buzzword, but it's probably not the actual scientific term, right? Yeah, the scientific term is cacophonous aggregation, which is way more annoying <laughs> to say. So I was just say funerals. Um, yep. And yeah, let me, let me give your listeners a little bit of background on what I mean when I say that. Yeah. So Typically how we see this behavior manifest is that the first bird to identify, you know, to see that there's a dead crow on the ground will alarm call. And then that results in the recruitment of other birds to the area. And they'll fly around, they'll alarm call. Um, they might settle down for a minute and get more aggravated. And then, you know, after about 15 or 20 minutes or so, it, it generally peters out and, and they leave. Mm -hmm. And so that's, to me, when I say funeral, I'm using that to express a phenomenon where individuals are gathering at the site of a dead body, right? Yeah. 
And so I don't have a lot of hangups about using that because, you know, I always make the effort to be like, but if it had, you know, whether or not it also has the implications of like a deep emotional standing and grief, we don't know. We simply don't know. I can't speak to that Spare. being true or not being true because we just we just don't know. But one of the other things I think it's important for listeners to appreciate is that this this concept that, um, you know, cor Corvids, because uh, it's not just crows, although they're the ones that have been most studied, do this. And you actually alluded to this at the top of the show is something that people have known about for a very long time. So that was not a unique thing that I contributed to science. In fact, we can see references in religious texts like the Quran to this behavior. Mm -hmm. My, um, what I contributed as a scientist was trying to get at the why. What is the, yeah. what is the adaptive value of this behavior? And so that's what I really focused my work on. So one thing that I, I find that's, it's really interesting, um, maybe as like a parallel is, well, that we can maybe talk about with, with humans versus like how, how, how crows react, um, is that there's a, a spectrum and, and percentages attributed to how a, a crow would react because you did say that like we have they have this like congregation and and that happens most of the time but there's also other possibilities right yeah so one of the interesting things that we revealed in our research was um that their response changes seasonally mm -hmm. so in the winter time it generally manifests exactly as i described it but to our shock <laughs> in the breeding season in the springtime, the summertime, it manifests a little bit differently. <laughs> and um, yeah, they, instead of just like kind of alarm calling and staying away from these bodies, they will come down and, inter you know, physically interact with them in a variety of ways. And they can be kind of like really exploratory where they're just kind of like gently touching them and kind of, it seems like they're kind of like testing the waters. Like, are you like a kid finding, you know, a dead animal in the woods. They're like, Ooh, giving it a little poke. They can be really <laughs> aggressive, um, just really t ripping these dead dead crows to pieces. Uh, or they can even, in rare cases, exhibit sexual behavior, uh, either copulating directly with these dead crows or the other interesting thing we saw, and again, this happened rarely, but it did happen repeatedly, was pairs that would come in and see this dead bird alarm call and then immediately copulate with each other. Um, <laughs> sometimes, and then the most rare version was that they did that with the dead crow, but that only oh, happened man. twice. <laughs> oh man, that's insane. Um, I, <laughs> that's that's really interesting. So, I mean, I, I think you alluded, alluded to that, like, the, you know, it only happened twice. So it's a very low, probabilistic outcome of, of, of these, these funerals. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The vast majority of, of what you're going to see most of the time is you're just going to see crows in the trees surrounding the area, making a lot of noise. Um, yeah. but if you catch the right moment, you might see something weirder. <laughs> Jeez. So you have the possibility of just uh, a normal gathering, um, maybe some offerings brought and then potentially something rough or something a little erotically rough that yeah so that that seems like the general yeah. the general category <laughs> so, okay. well it's the, the one thing i'll add is so one thing we never saw in our studies was the the offering of things but oh. that is something that we've had people tell us that they have seen mm. so i i remember when i was a grad student a woman sent us photos and she of this dead crow and it had this like, it was like a, it was a candy bar wrapper. I don't remember what kind. Um, and she was like, I, I just stood there and I watched and it like came over and it had it in its bill and it just kind of like dropped it there and walked away. Um, my dental hygienist told me the same thing. You know, I'm getting my teeth mm. cleaned and she's like, so what do you do? And I'm like, I was study crow funerals. <laughs> and she's like, oh, <laughs> well, let me tell you. When I was a kid, I lived on a farm and one day my dad shot a crow and I was really sad, so I was watching it, and all the crows, these brought like sticks over and they put it on this dead crow. So that's one of those interesting nuances that we weren't able to bear out in the studies that we did, but um, anecdotally, uh, you know, have presented themselves as a real phenomenon. Wow, okay. 
So possibly exists, but just in your studies, it, it just never showed up. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. And I, I think of it like, and this might sound weird at first, but like whenever I think of funerals um, from like a homo sapien point of view, I think of like, we also react in different ways too. Uh, like some people like are mourning, some people are bringing offerings, some people are a, a bit aggressive and some people sometimes awkwardly act sexual, not in the case of maybe a dead body, but hey, I mean, I don't know to each your own, but like there's, there's different ways that, that just it seems like animals in general will react, um, especially if they're social creatures to uh, the death of, of, of some, something or someone close to them. So I don't know. I, I find that yeah. kind of a little bit of a parallel. Yeah. No, no absolutely. And I, I'm glad that you point that out because it, it is really important to, to underscore that point. Cause a lot of people, you know, when they read this thing about the crows, they're like, well, that makes sense. Cause crows are weird and creepy and blah, 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 blah. But really the reality, as you have said, is that actually when we look at the pattern of behaviors within social animals, particularly those that exhibit a higher um, encephalization quotient, so the animals that we think of as being smarter based on their brain size, and the ones mm -hmm. that come first to mind are things like dolphins or elephants or primates, we see yeah. the exact same patterns of behavior where they can be affiliative, they can be violent, and they can be sexual. And really the only exception to that rule has been the elephants. But you know, if you oh. want some really gnarly stories of necrophilia, look into dolphins and whales, because <laughs> yeah. So don't be knocking my crows over here and letting all these other critters off the hook. <laughs> <laughs> On the necrophilia note, we're going to transition to something else. <laughs> oh, I can't laugh too much because I'm sick. Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> one more thing that I, I think it would be fun to cover before we go into break, because there's a lot of things that we could definitely cover on behavior, um, is the fact that crows play. I think it'd be really nice to end on a, on a better note than, than, you know, talking about animals and necrophilia. So please take me through like some examples of what you've seen or what you've what you've read of of how of how crows play and interact with with other um, animals? Yeah, so um, crows are are pretty unique amongst both birds and animals as a whole in that they uh, continue to play well into adulthood. Right, like people mm. are pretty unique. You know, outside of like our pets, when we think about wild animals, play is a huge privilege because it requires a level of safety and having your resources met, right? That is not necessarily frequently available depending on what kind of animal you are and what circumstances you're in. But we see these behaviors a lot in, in crows. And as of the last time I checked, which was granted a few years ago now, I think we'd only documented about seven species of birds across the 10,000 that exist that play wow. like into adulthood. So it's a pretty unique thing. And there's uh, many different kinds of play. The one that most irritates people is probably vocal play, which the kids do. Uh, where that's when they sit outside your window at five in the morning and they practice all the things they're gonna say, just like, <laughs> you know, human kids do. <laughs> but the more charming ones to watch are, are probably things related to object play. So games mm -hmm. like tug of war between two birds or ball, you know, they'll take, they'll take small round objects and um, throw them, drop them and try and catch them before they hit the ground. That's something I've personally seen them do. Um, nice. They also, sliding is a big one. So they love snow play, sliding down, um, you know, uh, hills, car windshields, sliding on objects like they're sledding. Um, so yeah, there's lots of really fun videos around this behavior. And, uh, you know, the reason, like I said, the reason that we get to see it more in crows is because their lifestyles and their um, social dynamics sort of afford them the opportunities to safely engage mm -hmm. in these behaviors. Whereas, you know, maybe your typical like mountain lion has a little bit more on their plate. So they don't, they don't get to like go sledding. <laughs> <laughs> Understood. Understood. I, I think uh, there was a story brought up, and I don't know if it was by you or by um, another uh, another activist, but 
they said that like so crows have been observed taking like say uh, a nut or, or something a ball like and then dropping it and then swooping down to catch it before it hits the ground and stuff like that like that's like in, in yeah. another in another sense of play but also uh, i've also heard um or seen footage of of crows like playing around with like wolves and stuff like say in um uh, yellowstone national park where they like uh create some sort of a, of a bond with like a specific wolf pup and then they kind of form this like little symbiosis during their lifetimes which is pretty cool well okay so, <laughs> so Sweet. if you're Wait. gonna open that can of worms, we, then we gotta go there because yes because so here's the deal so um common ravens have an incredibly cl close relationship with wolves and that's been the case uh, okay. So when we talk when we talk about that, we're talking about ravens, not crows, generally speaking. There you go. But and so one of the stories that often gets told is this idea of this friendly symbiotic relationship between the two animals. And often how that manifests is that when ravens are out flying, you know, across Yellowstone in the wintertime, they see a carcass, they'll call to the wolves and then the wolves come over and they will rip into the carcass and that allows the ravens to feed. Um, or, and so that's kind of like the relationship. The problem okay. with that story is no one has ever demonstrated it to be true. Ooh. And while ravens very much follow wolves around, right? Wolves by everything that we've seen, not such big fans of this behavior. Because yeah. really what the relationship is, is ravens are just stealing from wolves. <laughs> they're not, oh, okay, there's yeah. no, um, they've looked at calling patterns around carcasses and mm -hmm. there's no evidence that they attract wolves into them. Um, now that said, there have been observations that you did allude to of uh, ravens playing around with wolf pups. I don't think anyone's ever showed that that's like an ongoing relationship through the two animals lives. I don't want to say that that's not true. I just, I don't think anyone's demonstrated that yet. Okay. Um, and one other way that we could explain that dynamic is because ravens are, are getting in there and stealing uh, meat and wolves don't necessarily like it. One of mm -hmm. the costs of that and um, the term for that would be kleptoparasitism. So parasitism by stealing. Uh, yeah. One of the costs of that behavior is that wolves will try and kill them, and they do sometimes. Um, and so, one way we might explain, you know, the the wolf pup raven dynamic is that it's good practice for ravens to learn these animals Ooh. and get very adept at dodging them. Um, it okay. might also just genuinely be fun for both, because again, we do know that these birds play. So maybe it isn't that you know deep <laughs> and they are just like trying to have a good time um but that yep. wolf raven story is one that i see a lot and i just want to caution people that um yeah there there has yet to be a an experimental study that has bore a lot of those parts of that mythology out no that's that's really important and yeah definitely glad that you uh you said that because i haven't caught that really in um in the other podcasts that you've been on so Hopefully somebody can take away some new information from this one. I appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think we're going to run into a commercial break here, but then when we come back, I want to talk more about the cognitive abilities of uh, crows and ravens. So stick around. All right. This is segment three. And as I alluded to before we went into break, we're going to talk about the cognitive studies or just the cognitive ability of or of the Corvus genus. I, I originally said Corvid and I'm like, that is way too broad and we would never finish this because there's a lot to yeah. talk about. Uh, there's a lot <laughs> of uh, independent uh, evolution, uh, evolutionary steps that would just take forever for us to, to kind of go over. But like, I yeah. do want to say a little bit about the basics. Um, first of all, that, that mammals and if you want to say like birds, mammals and birds, they split in the evolutionary tree 320 million years ago. So there's a lot of, of stuff that have happened. But one thing that I do really want to note is that the um, is that mammals today and the, the Corvus genus that we're going to talk about both have um, a similar piece 
in their brain structure, which is called the phallium, right? The phallium. Um, and then whenever they That's did pallium. split, pallium, pallium, see pallium. See, I'm not a biologist. <laughs> but uh, whenever they did split, so they they uh, they Thallium's developed a, differently. on a different part of the body. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. Yeah. Um, never mind. So, um, anyways, <laughs> from <laughs> from there though, um, we have uh, different ways that that their brains have evolved. Uh, sp more specifically, the mammals have a, a cerebral cortex, whereas like birds, they do not have a cerebral cortex, but they do have a more um, developed uh, pallium. Correct? Yeah. So the the way that I um, often like to explain it is we can think of the avian brain and the mammalian brain, particularly when we're making comparisons between like crows and primates as like a mm. PC and a Mac. They do a lot of the same things, but the mm -hmm. way that they've gotten there, a little bit different. Yeah, it's a good way to put it. Um, also, also really cool to talk about is that from, from at least from what I've read is that the other fossils that we have of Corbett's in general is mm -hmm. from like the is it the miocene the miocene epic so maybe i've heard as late as 30 million years ago um i've also heard yeah. earlier dates but i mean of course that that's that's just like corvidae that's not talking about corvus in general do you know like the earliest that um that ravens and, and crows have surfaced I, that 30 million i think is is sounding right to me but i am no good with dates man so <laughs> that's fair <laughs> that's fair to, yeah i'd have to to look it up again oh uh, dylan the biologist was just on the podcast last and he's like yeah uh, whenever like biologists man they just you know it's just a real struggle to remember the geologic time frame like you know oh great you know well, we, and, 300 and million years that, ago yay <laughs> yeah yeah, Sorry, uh, more than that is that I'm more of an ecologist than I am a biologist. And so then that yeah. like further one step just like <laughs> washes me out, which um, to go to go back while we are in the biology realm, I, th mm. I was sort of my brain was lagging, but I have since caught up that I want to clarify to your listeners is that the avian, we consider the avian pallium to be essentially a cerebral cortex. So yes. it's it is. Um, it is different, but we, I, I wouldn't want to tell, I, I don't want somebody walking away thinking that they don't have that feature. It's just uh, formatted right. different. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. I, I don't, I don't know if I, if I said that correctly, I just said that I think that there's, there's developed into something that is quite like, yeah, a cerebral cortex. Yeah. Apologies. Yeah. 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 And one, one thing about the, um, uh, avian and mammalian brains that I think is, is, um, might strike your listeners is one of the uh, most distinctive things about it. And one of the reasons why for such a long time, scientists really had this very poor understanding of the avian brain and therefore this assumption that birds couldn't be very smart, right? Is that mm -hmm. um, bird brains are smooth relative to oh. mammalian brains. They don't, right? So we were yeah, like, oh, the the, and the whole reason that we, they don't have the folds I'm called oh, like, sorry. Yeah gyri or jerry or some I can't remember how you say it, but yeah, they don't have the folds. And the whole function of those folds in the mammalian brain is to is to provide more surface area, right? More neural yeah. neuronal density. But actually, mm -hmm. a lot of birds, including especially the corvids and the parrots, have a higher neuronal density relative to primates. And so yeah, yeah there's just all of these different interesting facets. Like I said, so they're they're really different things. But yet somehow mm -hmm. they do a lot of the same stuff and it's really incredible. Yeah, I saw I saw like an estimate of like uh, the the common raven and then the American crow that were like both compared to like rhesus monkeys and bonobos and their their neural density was was actually better. Like just yeah, like just a smidge yeah, but it's better. Pretty incredible. Yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. it's super incredible. So um, I guess it would be a good uh, transition point to talk about how, because there's these estimates, right? That like, uh, like a like a crow, like say like a New Caledonian crow has like the like the same cognitive abilities of like a five to seven year old um, like Homo sapien. Uh, I think it'd be a really cool transition to talk about how um, the the Corvus 
uh, brain or cognitive abilities uh, relative are relative to primates. Do you want to go into that? Yeah. So um, one of the the challenges. So we've we've known for decades now. You know, we've had good insight into how intelligent these birds are based on some of the behaviors and the experiments that we've done. But it is often very difficult to make direct comparisons between the two. And yeah. a, a big reason for that is that their bodies being so different sometimes mm. precludes being able to administer the same kinds of tests. And then you also have to factor in their individual natural histories. And, and so we, we can't always sort of make these apples to apples comparisons, but there is a study that came out a few years ago that was the first real where that was what they were doing. They were making direct comparisons between the cognitive abilities of ravens, both in the physical world and the social world, and how that compared to primates. And they found some, they found some surprising results, if memory serves. One thing is that ravens were a lot worse than primates at the spatial skills. But they were pretty hmm. comparable when it came to uh, issues of like theory of mind, a lot of like the social stuff. Um, and oh, like I am pretty me comparable kind of when it comes to, mm -hmm, and pretty comparable when it came to things like causal reasoning. And mm. so where that leaves us without, you know, maybe getting too into the details of that particular study, because it was a, it was a complicated one. And I, I have a um, blog article on it if anybody wants to like unpack it more, but, um, the fact that it revealed these striking similarities across these different areas of, of intelligence when it comes to both their understanding of the physical world and also their in social intelligence, the fact that they were so close at all in any of these categories to primates, when you kind of just step back and reflect on, like you said, that the time, the evolutionary mm -hmm. time that exists between our two species and just how different we are in so many ways. Mm -hmm. And yet, it has, evolution has produced two different things that are very comparable and it, it's really incredible. And we would often, you know, the language I'd sometimes hear people say is like, corvids are flying monkeys, but maybe we should say, you know, monkeys are just land bound <laughs> corvids. <laughs> like it's just, there's so yeah. much between the two. And for your listeners um, who maybe don't know much about this topic, I, I guess I, I might want to offer that that, um, you know, it, testing intelligence is a very fraught subject, right? Because yeah. it's very hard to imagine how scientists can divorce their own hubris and their, the, the bias of their own lenses of how we experience and understand the world and somehow tease that out of non-human animals. And that's, that's a really valid criticism. It's one that I, you know, it's so important to persist because it makes us uh, you know, forces us to ask, like, are these tests that we're running really getting at these questions and all of that? But we mm -hmm. have developed a sort of cognitive toolkit that we, for now, think is a pretty accurate reflection of behaviors and abilities that reflect intelligence that is cognitively informed as opposed mm -hmm. to more innate or more like trial and error. And those things, just to uh, bring your listeners into this, is um, things like causal reasoning, right? So understanding the relationship between cause and effect, very difficult to do. And you can be very successful, right? Evolution doesn't care about intelligence. It cares about your ability to produce more offspring. You don't have to be smart to be incredibly successful, right? And so that's an yep. important thing to bear in mind. Um, but causal reasoning, the, the uh, ability to understand the, the relationship between two things, you can be very successful and not understand that and still take advantage of it, right? So you mm -hmm. don't have to know what, why dropping a clam on a rock necessarily works, as long as you mostly are on a beach with rocks so that when you drop your clam, it hits a rock more often than it doesn't. Um, yeah. And so, so causal reasoning is part of that toolkit, mental time travel. So being able to um, think in the past and plan for the future mm -hmm. in an active way rather than a passive way. A lot of animals can plan for the future in passive ways that don't actually reflect that they understand the future 
uh, in the same way that like we do. But we've mm -hmm. been able to demonstrate that in the Corvids. Uh, imagination is another big one that's, I think, funny for a lot of people to hear because imagination is such a integral part to our experience of humanity that it's hard to imagine <laughs> that other yeah. animals don't <laughs> have that experience. But there's mm -hmm. very little evidence that most of the rest of, you know, animal organisms do. And then the last one is causal reasoning, prospection, oh, as flexibility, right? So being able to take in information and have that change your behavior. Because again, you can be very successful as an individual or as a species executing very stereotyped responses without really understanding what they're for. But right. it can be really helpful if you do understand what they're for and then you can adjust them based on new context and new information. Yeah, no, that that makes a lot of sense. And I'm glad that you actually cleared that up for for the listeners, because I honestly what I was planning on talking about was just like the specifics of like, or I guess nitpicking some things that that uh, that the Corvus genus does that makes them stand out. Um, you know, in the cognitive realm, um, like for example, like you said, with like imagination or uh, planning for the future, those are those are really, like we say that we're really intelligent, but then there's 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 other um, animals out there that do that stuff. It's it's really really impressive. So you you did say that that like that they do plan for the future. How did you how did they find out that that they actually do that? Just just so just to feed the listeners here. Yeah. Yeah, so, so for this example, we're actually going to draw outside of the Corvus genus, and we're going to look at the jays, because jays have been uh, really good models nice. for this kind of work. So when animals hide food for later, we call that caching. Oh, yeah. And mm -hmm. so some animals are opportunistic cachers, like crows. If you feed crows peanuts, they can't finish them all in one setting. They'll go and they'll hide them in your gutter, and they'll probably forget about <laughs> most of them. No big deal. But some animals you know, hide food and they have to retrieve it later because that's going to be the only food that's available. And we call those mm -hmm. um, obligate cachers. And so jays, depending on what the species is, can represent both. But, you know, they have a, um, a strong behavioral repertoire that includes hiding food for later. So one of the ways that we've demonstrated this flexibility and mental time travel is, say you, you have a jay, I think they've done this mostly with scrub jays, of which there are a variety of species, but we won't get into that. You say you have a jay in, a, in an aviary and it's um, partitioned in some ways, right? So that you could control its access to various places within its aviary. And at first you, the bird has access everywhere and in the morning you feed it and it's hiding food all over the place. And then after a while you start to, in the afternoon, you start to make it so it only has access to one section of its aviary. Well, we see if we do that, their caching behavior switches. So now they're not just hiding food everywhere. Now they're only hiding food in the part of the aviary that they are anticipating they're gonna be limited to in the future, right? So that's a level of like taking in uh, information about the way that their environment is changing and then using mm -hmm. that to plan for the future rather than just the like, I have food, I put food here and we'll see what happens later. <laughs> Oh, that's so cool. That's so cool. I love that. Um, if you don't mind, I, I might just ask one more question because that's really interesting, really fascinating is the fact that they have an imagination. Can can you maybe give a scenario where that that is that is true? Yeah, so that's one of my favorite studies. So this this was Sweet. one done on ravens, common ravens, <clears throat> and it's kind of similar setup. So a lot of these kinds of studies utilize captive animals, right? Where we have more, we can control more aspects of their environment. We know mm -hmm. we understand these birds on an individual uh, level better in their relationship. And so ravens, likewise, another caching species. But the problem, if you are a caching species and also a social species, is that sometimes your caches get stolen, right? If, if someone's watching you hide your food, and then they might go and they might steal it for themselves. And so ravens are very sensitive to this. And, and, we, and the, we knew this going into the study I'm about to describe. And so they took advantage of that, of the fact that ravens behave differently if they think they're being watched as opposed to if they think they're alone. Mm -hmm. And so the experimental paradigm was, was they had this aviary and they put a partition 
between it. And in that partition, they installed a, they drilled a peephole. So the first phase of the project is you put a raven on one side, you put its you know handler on the other side, the handler calls to it. That gives the raven experience, it like goes up and it looks through the peephole and it's like, oh, they have food. And it gives them experience with like interacting with the peephole. Mm -hmm. And then the next phase of the experiment was, okay, put the raven, you know, back in the aviary. And now on the other side, we're going to, we're going to put a speaker that just plays raven calls. Cause one of the difficulties in testing, um, imagination was what's called the gaze effect. So if birds could see another bird looking at them, it sort of, um, it made it harder to cleanly interpret the results as being reflective of imagination. So the way that they got around this was by using vocalizations. So they would put a speaker on the other side, they'd give our, our raven subject some food, and mm -hmm. they would either have that peephole open or closed. And what they found is if it was closed, even if they could hear another raven, they cached as if they were alone. But if it was open, even though they couldn't see anybody over there, they could just hear mm -hmm. it. They cached as if they were being watched, nice. which suggests that they had they were drawing on that experience of looking through the people being like, oh, you can see through that and imagining the possibility that someone was doing that to them, even though they didn't have any visual evidence that that was the case. They could mm. just imagine that it might be. Oh, that's really neat. And that also kind of stems off of, I think, what you said in a, in a podcast before is that you are following um, these uh, this crow this crow couple, and uh, at one point they they built a nest, but then they didn't continue building the nest, and it was actually just a diversion to where they actually were living, which is which is really cool, and I think has to you know it's yeah. also recognize it's recognition, but also uh, planning and a little bit of of imagination as well, because they're imagining that you're you're some sort mm -hmm. of, a, of a of a predator or a threat. Yeah, yeah, that could that could be another example. I mean, it's yeah, I think once we further, you know, tap into this well of of understanding and knowledge, it will it might really shift the way that we interpret some of their other behaviors too. That's really exciting. Uh, I know we're a little short on time here, Kaylee, but this has been an absolutely fantastic podcast. I do recommend that the listeners, the watchers, the people of um both you and I's uh, pool that they should definitely, if they have not listened to your podcast with ologies or uh, visit your, your, your blog, which is uh, Corvid research, right? Corvidresearch.org mm -hmm. or just, yep. just, uh, there you go. Dot com. Um, mm -hmm. Dot com. Dot com. And of course, you're, oh, you no, also dot have blog. Dot blog. <laughs> dot blog. Dot blog. Yeah. There you go. Corvid research. Dot blog. <laughs> Yes, and also uh, you have a YouTube channel, correct? I do. I'm not super active on my YouTube channel, um, but I do. I exist there, and then I exist on pretty much all the other social media platforms, all under the Corvid Research handle. It's all the same. That's that's the best way to do it. Yeah, to have to have that yeah. continuity <laughs> is just so important. Absolutely. Well, Kaylee, this has been wonderful. Thank you for being on the podcast. And I'm so happy that I had the opportunity to meet and, and converse with you on this because this, what a fantastic, um, what a fantastic thing to talk about. And also your, your work is just wonderful. So I really appreciate it. Thanks so much, Sam. It was my pleasure to be here. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm happy that I, I gave you some new thoughts about crows. That's my, that's my main goal. <laughs> that is all for this episode of Everything Steam. I just wanted to take a quick second and thank Kaylee for sharing her knowledge and expertise about Corvids. Be sure to check out her content. The best way to access her social media, research, science communication pieces, and FAQs is through her website, corvidresearch.blog. I would also love to mention my amazing team for their collective efforts to make this show happen. This podcast was edited by Ariel Piermont, QC by Panny Pit Erickson, and our episode art was created by Gabrielle Edmiston. After the episode, please give our podcast a rating and review on whatever platform you get your podcasts on. We're always looking for feedback, and the rating would greatly help us out in the fight against those algorithms. Lastly, be sure to check us out on all the socials for podcast news, upcoming episodes, and just fun Steam content. Just search Everything Steam on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, and Reddit to join in on the fun. Once again, thank you for listening to Everything Steam. I'm your host, Sam Stanford, and as always, stay curious.